Hello everyone, great to see you again. Dan Pierce here with Mentally Fit, and we are joined by Lainey Rosenswag, LMFT, creator of Accelerated Resolution Therapy, and today she's going to be telling us about her method. So let's jump right in. Lainey, okay, nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. So uh, I would like to take you through a PowerPoint, and then I would like to show you some video of uh, some of the things that uh, we call it art. It's accelerated resolution therapy, but we often call it art. And I am going to whoop, go back to the top because it was already on. So you can see this, right? Yes. And I can see that I messed up the word resolution. So that should be resolution. So um, we say a picture is worth a thousand words. I'm very interested in images with trauma because I believe it's the images that uh, are causing problems and not the cognitions. I don't believe it's the thoughts. I think it's the pictures. So we say keep the knowledge, lose the pain, because a client who goes through accelerated resolution therapy is going to have all the facts, perhaps more facts, about uh, a trauma. Um, but we want to get rid of those negative images. And with eye movements, you can actually do that pretty successfully. So what makes art different from other therapies? Um, I know we've trained on the tr uh, army bases we've gone to. They really like the therapy because it reduces what we call compassion fatigue. And that's where therapists have to take the burden on of listening to the trauma. And then they get secondary gain, and we really don't want that. With this therapy, uh, the client doesn't even have to tell you what the problem is. And you use this therapeutic procedure and its protocol, and you can actually get wonderful results even without hearing what it was. Um, it's very fast. I can do a specific trauma from the past almost always in an hour's time. If it's an ongoing problem, it may take up to five sessions uh, to do that. So we know that ongoing problems have secondary gains, which means there may be a reason why it's difficult for the client to let go of that issue. So it might take a little longer. And that's what I say right here. Okay, so once again, I'm focused on images and the sensations that come from the images. I don't care quite as much about those cognitions. So what happens when you change an image is the cognitions will change naturally. So if somebody thinks that it was their fault and they have guilt and they go through the procedure and they change their uh, images, uh, the guilt goes away too. It's very interesting and it's less work once a therapist learns how to do this. So we have more outcome pr pr uh, predictability than uh, a lot of other therapies. It's a systematic approach and I say that because if a therapist trains with us, they get a script on how to do things. And we do add interventions to those scripts. So it makes it very creative and sometimes uh, it's fun. So um, we do process those sensations regularly. Um, I will talk about the differences between art and EMDR. Uh, so I will tell you, I was trained in EMDR and... I uh, thought I was doing EMDR, but changed it to make it more directive. I went for supervision, and the supervisor said, uh, you're not doing EMDR. I don't know what you're doing, but go back to doing it our way or call it something else. And that's when I realized there were actually a lot of differences between what I was doing and uh, what other people were doing uh, in EMDR. Uh, so we've trained at Walter Reed, I don't know, three times. Uh, and Fort Belvoir maybe six times, Fort Drum, we've been to Fort Drum, Fort Stewart, Fort Hood, uh, Lemoore uh, Naval Air uh, Station in California. There's some retreats that will only use my therapy. They believe in it uh, for the veterans. One is called the Veterans Alternative, and veterans will get free treatment at that location. 
the warrior mission at ease was developed by one of the therapists I've trained and that's going very well. Um, Lone Survivor is in Texas and North Carolina. I've been out there to work with veterans also. Uh, and uh, Marcus Luttrell, uh, it was his organization. He's the one that was in the movie, uh, The Lone Survivor. There's a place called The Refuge. They focus on substance abuse in Florida. And we've been out there. Also been to Betty Ford Clinic. Uh, my lead trainer, Amy Schumann, uh, from Western New England University, everybody in the counseling center there is trained. And we've trained some Idaho National Guard practitioners uh, in Connecticut, where I'm from. We've been to the Connection and done trainings there. I have a clinician that's trained over 400 people in Canada and still training, like having two trainings a week. So it's growing there. Uh, and we've been to Kansas as well. We've had people come to train with us from the UK, Italy, Scotland, Australia, New Zealand, and Ireland. So I talk about what's different about an intake for art than other therapies, perhaps. Well, every good therapy should have some kind of goal. But we dare to ask, how do you want to feel differently at the end of this session? I think a lot of uh, therapies would uh, be hesitant to ask that question. They might think they might not be able to get there, but we want to know how does the client want to feel differently because we're dealing with sensations uh, that come from the emotions and the problem. I use a lot of gestalt. I teach to use a lot of gestalt, which means somebody can go in their mind and uh, have a conversation with somebody to finish and have some closure, say, with grief. There has been a grief study, and it can't, the uh, results were really good from that. So uh, understanding that the eye movements add this piece of reality to what you're doing makes it easy to go back and say, rescue earlier selves uh, who were having in a childhood where they were unhappy, for example. Um, Out-processing. That's my word for getting rid of... Uh, uh, images that are particular and stuck. So we'll ask a client to go back and see with a set of eye movements, are there any stuck images you can still see? And we uh, learn how I teach how to erase those images from view. Are they still there? I don't know where they go, but the client will say, I can no longer see it. And that's what makes art so quick. If you get rid of the images, kind of like Nobody likes the dentist, but if you go in and you have a cavity filled, you take out the negative, you put in the positive, you're done. And that's part of why art is so quick. So I love metaphor. You know, if you're out there and you love metaphors, you would love this therapy. Um, dreams are made of metaphors, and we're using eye movements that may be similar to REM sleep. And in, in that way, uh, the metaphorical pieces work very, very quickly. A scene match is getting to the origin of the problem, and you can do that by going off the sensation and matching it to a time when they felt that same sensation, and the eye movements will hone in on it, and uh, sure enough, they may find out what caused their issue. So that we do get asked frequently about uh, EMDR and the differences, and so what I would say is we go beyond desensitization, and I call it positization. So we're not going to stop at desensitizing. We're going to put in good images, and that makes a lot of difference. We're standing on the shoulders of a giant, which is Francine Shapiro, uh, who we, we've lost. But uh, she got the eye movements out there, and they're all over the world. And so she deserves a lot of credit for what she's done. Um, uh, however, you know, we do not free associate the way EMDR does. So EMDR may take a little longer. It may take a week, a month. I've had someone come to me that said it was a year uh, that it took. Um, and we have the scripts that guide the therapist uh, who can add their own creative skills and uh, creative in interventions uh, Francine didn't really want you to get too involved. She wanted the client to do their own work by free associating. And we tend to get involved a lot more. So I had a client who was in 9-11, and uh, 
when we do this uh, subjective unit of distress, which is called the SUDS, uh, she started out a, as a uh, 10 when she saw her EMDR therapist. And she went down to a 4, but she could still see the body parts. That was the problem. So she came to me, and in one session, I was, be able, was able to help her put those uh, images aside, not be able to see them, and then she went to a 0, meaning she could now handle it. Right. Um, so, again, this is just repeating that past traumas can often be done in an hour. So EMDR has this um, intervention where they, at the end of a session, might put it in a container or a box if it's not completed. I try to get whatever we bite off uh, that piece to be completed by the end of the session, and we have ways to do that. Um, so... Uh, Again, I talk about uh, desensitization versus positization. Um, and I told you about the 9-11 uh, client. So you have to understand, unless you try it, it's very difficult to understand that you get the sensation with the eye movements that you're actually there. Pretty much like a dream you've had that felt so real to you. And that's really helpful with therapy, to be able to put the person in that place. <clears throat> and I talked about Gestalt. We do a lot of rescuing of earlier selves, taking them out of the scenes, um, uh, going back and having conversations with your earlier selves. And the earlier selves are the ones that are still hurting inside of you. Uh, there are therapies that are created around that as well um, that talk about going back to rescue earlier selves. We do it quite nicely with the eye movements and the use of the Gestalt. And I have said it's great for unfinished uh, business changing. Perspectives change very quickly. Um, it's very empowering to have the client be able to go back and <clears throat> sort of redo their childhood with a good dream. I would say it's a lucid dream they create. And they know it's not real, but it's like a dream. You know the dream wasn't real. But still, in all, it can help you if you have a, a dream that figures things out for you. I think I talked a lot about this uh, slide already. Um, and I do uh, talk about a rhythm and a cadence with our therapy. We tend to repeat things in the script so the brain doesn't have to figure out what you just said. Um, uh, and so that's uh, one thing we do. We use humor. I think humor is the opposite of trauma. Uh, and here I give an example. I talk about uh, a sexual abuse victim, and her brothers molested her. I suggested she put a bubble on the door, and when they would hit the bubble, they would bounce off, and it would go boing. She actually came back laughing about it uh, for the first time in her life, and being able to have the ability to decide what happened to these people before they could ever get to her and abuse her. So a lot of what we do is to tell the brain, you know what, it didn't happen. However, the client knows it happened with the words, you know, so they have the words, they have that knowledge, but when the pictures are gone, then uh, the uh, symptoms can abate. Okay, so, um, well, I'll talk about the palmetto bug. I did a live demonstration on someone during the training who had a very big fear of palmetto bugs. So I told her to dress the bug up as one of her favorite singing stars. So that bug became Willie Nelson, and it had a shawl, and it had a hat, and it had a guitar. And she was hysterical after she did her set of eye movements and saw Willie. And at the end, she said, so if I see it, what should I do? Because it's Willie. Should I kill it? But it's nasty. I'll just take care of it. And this is someone that used to stand on the desk and just scream when she would see a palmetto bug. So I'm going to move ahead. Um, so, uh, you know, we only have three criteria for art, if you want to uh, see what those are. Uh, it's not dependent on age, because people say, how young can you do it? Well, the eye movements are very relaxing, and if a child is really too young to do art, you can use the eye movements just to relax that child. But a client needs to be able to move their eyes 
comfortably and fairly quickly back and forth. We find the faster, the better. Uh, they need to be able to hold on to a thought. And they should be motivated because it's not mind control. If you don't want to change something, you're not going to change it. We're not going to do that. Uh, we want you on board. We want you to want to feel better. Some clients are afraid to feel better this quickly. So you have to take it a bit slower uh, with those clients. However, during my advanced training, I have a script for people who are afraid uh, to make a change. And it's all done metaphorically as we take them to the fair. And there are um, uh, the past, the present, and the future tense. But they are T-E-N-T-S. So we have a lot of fun with that. And that can be very useful if somebody has a fear of change because they say, who am I going to be if I change? I've been this way so long. So here I'm reminding you, you don't have to talk about your problem because it's a procedure, uh, although very creative procedure. So uh, I have seen a COVID uh, client uh, who did get her taste and smell back. I have a six-minute video of that that I will play for you. Um, and I did see a physician from New York, and she was seeing uh, people die nightly, and she was, you know, couldn't handle it. And when she came in, we were able to change some images for her so that when that did happen, she could go to a place where she would be able to manage it in her mind. Uh, and so I talk about an EAP. I've always wanted to have an EAP because this is so quick. And so I have that slide in there because I've done presentations for EAPs. Um, so I'm very quickly going to talk about art scripts because that helps you to understand uh, what's going on when you're learning this. So every level has a unique script, and uh, but we have a lot of room for creativity. Um, and it's a good way to explain the therapy. So if someone's taking a three-day training, which is the basic, they're going to get a, a, the ability to move sensations just on the first day. And they're going to be surprised. Who's so going to say, do you have a headache? What do you have? And in a few minutes, you can move a sensation when you do the eye movements with the right amount in the right way. Um, and then day two, you get a, a script for trauma. And that's the basic script that we use quite a bit to um, help people with PTS or, you know, whatever the trauma is. And the last day, I did a script that's an, uh, for ongoing problems, OCD, substance abuse. These are the other things we can do. Generalized anxiety, depression. Uh, that script will work. Uh, for those things. Uh, if and on day, uh, did I skip day one here? So, yeah, so for our second training, that's a two day training. And the very first thing that somebody will learn is what I call the metaphorical moment. We can move a problem in a half an hour, make it even quicker, because we do it with a picture instead of the real problem. So, put the problem into a picture, resolve it there and then bring it back to the real problem, and suddenly the answer kind of just emerges. And the fear uh, flip is what I talked about for people who have a fear of change, and that's learned on day two of the advanced training. Um, we get a script in the final two-day training. I call it the little liar. That's the piece of us that's very mischievous and tells uh, an alcoholic it's okay to drink and we do externalization, meaning you're not a bad person, but you have a part of you that's kind of fibbing to you. So let's uh, go ahead and see how we're going to battle that little liar. And believe it or not, I've tried this therapy on anything that comes my way. So if somebody has trauma and they have developed dyslexia, uh, we can actually get somebody to read very quickly by processing out the trauma and the sensations uh, for the reading. And I do a few other things to make some new connections for that client. Uh, you will see a video of somebody reading after I have done that with them uh, coming up. And we've actually been able to help people after a stroke to do things like um, have a better balance and be able to walk by getting rid of these uh, traumatic images. And I have a a video of somebody showing you that too after we're done with the uh, PowerPoint. 
we're very good with phobia. And uh, that's because we're not born with a phobia. It comes about because something happened and you have an image somewhere uh, of something that needs to be erased. So the phobia I'll show you is a fear of heights. Um, and I have a video of somebody who had a very bad fear of heights because when she was a little girl, she would look through a, a staircase that had, you know, air between the steps. So it had those slats with the air between, and she thought she'd fall through when she was very little. Well, that carries through, and now she has a fear of heights until she was my demonstration in a training. So I had a couple of overviews. I don't know that I'll go through all of them. Um, the story of the birds, somebody had a phobia. Uh, after seeing the birds as a little girl, she uh, was afraid of birds. And so she had one, but her husband would take care of it. So she was also a demo. <laughs> I do demos when I train. And um, so I did, uh, during the scene, we changed the scenes in the mind. As I said, they can uh, pick a new image, a new scene. I gave her the suggestion to meet up with uh, Alfred Hitchcock, and he was going to take her around the set to see that the birds were really actors. And she gets this image of Walt Disney and uh, the line with the birds on it that are so, you know, happy. <laughs> and uh, so um, she goes home after we process out her sensations and do the scenes. And she sticks her hand in the birdcage to feed the bird, and it bites her, her worst moment, right? bites her and she comes in the next day for the final day of training she tells the group um you know the bird bit me i think i moved too fast i'm gonna have to take my time next time and feed it slowly and uh still had no fear at that point so um that was really good so um i'm trying to see what else i want to tell you so um i uh, the very first one on this uh slide is a mother's suicide. So I had a man coming in, he was in his 30s. And ever since he was like 14, he felt guilty about his mother's suicide because she um, had tried many times before, but she had gotten really nice before she did this. And he thought he should have recognized the change in behavior and saved her. So what I did, I sent him back to meet with his mother and have a conversation. And she said, I'm so glad you didn't stop me. I was going to do it anyway. You gave me a chance to tell you how much I loved you. And uh, that kind of turned the tide for him. And he just felt different about it. He said that was what was meant to happen. That's the way it was. And I said, you know, but you've been beating up on your 14-year-old all these years. So you need to go back and you have to, um, you know, forgive your 14-year-old because you've been blaming that 14-year-old. And sure enough, he went back and I did some eye movements and he came back and he said, uh, well, he said, oh, forgive me, but I should never, ever blame him again. And uh, when he came in for the next session, he came in to talk about a relationship with his girlfriend. And I said, well, what about your mom's suicide? And he said, uh, Oh, no, that's done. No, thank you so much. That's done. I would like to talk about my girlfriend now. So that finished that for him. You will be seeing a postal worker video. It's the first one that I show when people train, but I, it's uh, pretty condensed. But I want to show you a video, a little bit of it. Uh, she was mauled by a dog. She had three operations, had not delivered mail in almost two years, had prolonged exposure for almost a year and a half, nothing was working. I had to walk her into my house. Uh, and after the therapy, she was ready to get back to work. And you'll see that in a video as well. Yeah, she definitely had agoraphobia, couldn't leave her house. Um, I'm going to go quickly to talk about metaphors because I want to get to show you the uh, videos I have and leave time for questions. If you listen to our music, songs are very metaphorical, especially something like Adele. If you listen to the lyrics like Rolling in the Deep, you know, um, so and you can remember things based on music as well. Um, 
And it's uh, the emotion that they're trying to get by doing the metaphors. If you're in your car listening, you can hear the metaphors about you had my heart in your hand and all that stuff that they say that uh, makes it uh, very emotional. Um, metaphors are the language of dreams. I think they're easy to see. They're faster to work with. Uh, they can make new connections in the brain. Um, and they're often more fun than the real deal. So we start out teaching something about metaphor. And then when you go to the advanced trainings, we teach you more about it. Uh, it's the stuff dreams are made of. So, uh, you know, someone can have a fear and it turns into a monster in the dream. Yeah. And that's what uh, we do with metaphor when we're sleeping. Um, okay. Um, so here's an example of externalization with a client that I saw. Um, he had OCD, and he had to check his oil every hour on the hour. A very disruptive to his life. I had him pick his little liar, and he turned it into a devil. I had him pick his support self, and he turned it into an angel. And he came in for his next session. I said, what happened? He said, the devil said that I had to check my oil. The angel said, I, you don't have to check your oil. So I went into the kitchen and made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and I let them argue it out. That's a really good example of externalizing a problem. Uh, and, you know, art makes a lot of good connections. So when I was working with a client afraid of frogs, believe it or not, a lot of people are afraid of frogs, and it must be that leaping uh, motion. But she called her frog Leopold, and she didn't know why. So I said, well, let me do some more eye movements. Let's see if we can figure out why. She said, you know what? After the eye movement, she said, I'm a Leo, and it had a staff. I think it was a pole when it was in my scene, and that frog was helping me. And she called that frog Leopold. So sometimes we're going to aid a client in kind of discussing uh, choices you know, if you're going to take your problem and put it into a picture, what could what could your choices be? Well, for loneliness, you could be on a mountaintop and maybe your family's on the other mountain. Or codependency, you're on that roller coaster ride with that partner. And so it's easier to see it in a picture. Before I developed art, I was using metaphor. So I might have somebody who was married to an alcoholic and they just wanted to take a separation but couldn't, and I would say, well, your alcoholic is on the uh, Titanic and it's going down and your kids are in the life raft, you know, what do you want to do? I think when you add the visual to it, it makes it much clearer uh, in that way. So we use a lot of metaphors, as I said, so here are some examples. If someone says they're on a fence, for example, and you're using the eye movements with them. With the eye movements, they can push themselves over the fence and make a decision. So very good for decision making, by the way, when you do a, a metaphor, because it takes it out of reality, puts it into an image, and it's easier to fix that image than it is to fix your real problem. But then you can take it back and relate it to the real problem. And you've heard clients, if you're a therapist, You've heard your clients say, my back's against the wall, my hands are tied, I'm on the spot, you know, and if you do it visually, they can get off the spot, you know. Um, so if they're at the end of the rope, they, their rope, they can get more rope. So it's very fixable to do something with a metaphor. I use a play on words, uh, and it's one of my favorite things to do. So uh, what I'm saying here is if someone has a sensation of pain, on their right side, I might say, right about it. What I'm guessing it may do is to confuse sort of that prefrontal cortex, the one that we think with, and while it's trying to figure it out, it goes into wherever it goes to get rid of that sensation. So I have a pain on my left side. Um, so I might say, erase what's left. And that's, uh, we're trying to confuse the client in some ways. Uh, so talking more about some of our uh, interventions, when somebody's ang angry, I might give them a megaphone and they might say, I say, where do you feel that? I feel that in my chest. Here's a megaphone. I want you to scream out in your mind, whatever that's trying to say. And I'll do the eye movements and that anger will leave them. Making new connections. I know my brother in England is listening to this talk. And he had told me his kids had some trouble with 
falling asleep in the dark. And I said, we're going to, I taught him how to do it on the phone just to make a new connection for his kids to something good, something good in the dark, not bad. So blowing out candles, fireworks. And he said, I think he said it was just like 15 minutes per child and they were good. And he was one of the ones that told me when I was told, uh, call it something else because it's not EMDR. He kept telling me, you really do need to do that because it's so good. So uh, he pushed me to do that. Uh, so if you have somebody with substance, for example, and I just told one of my clinicians to try this, so you could have two doors. One door is, this is what's going to happen if you keep using. Let's have you go through the door and see what happens. Their brain will take care of the rest. You don't have to worry or create that for them. The eye movements tend to uh, move to the positive. Um, uh, EMDR calls that AIP, which stands for Adaptive Information Processing. That's one of the things I noticed in the training. And what I loved about the eye movements is they tend to move to the positive. But you could have a door where they go through the negative and see what will happen if they don't stop. So I did that with someone who then said I was going by the package store and I could see the image of the negative door over that door and I didn't go in. So it can be very, very good that way. Lots of people think they have to be perfect. That's a problem we have. And I tell them, you know, that train doesn't really go to perfection. You have to get off it. Good enough is perfect. And they get to explore it. And uh, I have people saying, you know, it wasn't so bad when I got off the train. It was actually pretty good there. Uh, so another metaphor. I can send people to stores. I often send them to if they have a, a childhood that wasn't the best, I say, go get another set of parents. And they might pick, you know, Mr. Rogers, Tom Hanks. And in their mind, they have another set of parents that's very positive for them. And they get that feeling because uh, we're working with sensations, emotions when we do art. We're in the limbic system. We're in that part that uh, can make these changes. We can handle strong reactions. So I show a video of a burn victim. And she has a huge reaction. Do you keep using the eye movements? You tell them to take a breath. You keep using them. And then they never feel that way again after you move it, move it, move it. So one of the things art is very good at is uh, handling the uh, deep emotional states that keep people stuck. And we can actually move them. So I put here, if you do want to take a training and you are a therapist, um, that you can go to our website and sign up, which is www.artworks, with a plural, W-O-R-K-S, now, N-O-W.com. Or you can call 877-675-7153. I give my email, which is Y-E-N-A-L, that's my name backwards, 3523 at yahoo.com. And um, I want to... Uh, get out of this and uh, want to go to show you some video that you might enjoy. So first thing I'm going to show you is a 15 minute video of the postal worker. So remember, this is a condensed uh, version of the hour long video, but you can hear some of the changes as she makes them. And I also have a follow up with that. So I'm going to just play this right now. What we're going to do, what we're doing here, is getting rid of the images in your head for what happened. And my understanding is you were bit by a dog and you deliver my own. Um, I was attacked by a dog. I was bit like seven times. I was in the hospital for a week. So it was more than just a dog bite. Yeah, yeah it was pretty bad. So um, sometimes we're going to focus on the sensations and emotions in your body. Okay. And we're going to work on we're moving those or getting you comfortable. Sometimes I'm going to have you look at the scene of what happened. You're, you're deciding the beginning and the end. You're putting in all the distress. If you could get back to work, would they allow it? Oh, they they want me to. Okay, great. Okay, and you want to. Yes. So you're motivated to do mm -hmm. this. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. When you look at these emotions, what emotions do you feel about that scene where you were attacked by the dog? Like, there could be something else that's not on the list you want to say. That's okay. Um, what 
Oh my wow, God. every single one of those. Oh, is every there anything single that one. doesn't apply? <laughs> that's every single one. Everything. Um, everything. Yeah. I'm uh, jealous. Know. Well, no, that's not true. That's kind of a new one now. Because you're jealous of people that can work? Yes, that's exactly it. Interesting. Very interesting. On a scale of 0 to 10, when you think about what happened, which you do probably quite a bit, 0 means I can handle it, it's no problem. 10 means, oh, it's the worst. Where would you put this slider right now? How bad For, is it? Like you're thinking about being attacked by the dog and what it does to you. 10 um, is like, I can't handle it. Um, um, you seem already pretty upset, so I would guess it's way up there. 10 plus, right? Okay. So we're going to start out before we even begin by getting you relaxed and ready to begin. Because I'm not even going to start with you until you feel you can do it. That sound good? Okay. Right? You go to the dentist, they give you what? No, okay. Mm -hmm. And they say, are you ready? And you say yes or no, right? All right. So you're looking at the wall. Keep your head back in that direction. Mm -hmm. What sensations do you have in your body right now from head to toe? I can see it's hard for you to breathe. Um, so. I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I'm nervous. Mm -hmm. Okay. And where do you feel all that anxiety? Is it all over your body? Um, I can feel my shoulders starting to hunch up to my ears. I feel it in my stomach okay. and my chest. Okay. You're also brave for coming in here. I want to add that. I want to add a positive. Okay. Brave. So notice how you're feeling. That's all I want you to do. Sometimes we're just focused on the feelings. Mm -hmm. And follow, keep your head still and follow my hand with your eyes. So I'm going to follow. See my hand in front of you? Just kind of track that. Perfect. Wonderful. Just notice how you're feeling. Oh, that was good. Take a deep breath. Now check your body again and tell me if anything has moved or changed at all about any of the sensations. Um, my shoulders don't feel so raised. Good. My breathing is better. I remember actually saying in my head, ah, something else I can focus on. I don't have to think about that. Um, and obviously as I talk, I, it, it just comes up. It, it comes it, up again. It comes up. Because you have dreamt about it, haven't you? Every night I dream. And you, your sleep's lousy. Yes. Okay. And it intrudes into everyday life. Every I want the same okay. expect. I so, want to know what the expectation is so I can gauge. The expectation you know? is that I'm going to be able to grab all those negative sensations. So we want them to come up. That's why we okay. expose you to the scene, okay? So I want them. Okay. So you're just going to allow yourself to feel as okay. bad as it gets. But I'm going to break it up into parts, make it a little easier, and stop you so you may not get through the whole scene right away. And then we'll deal with the sensations, and then we'll go back. And by the second time you see okay. it, which could be five minutes later, it will change your life. That's how quick this is. Okay. So we just, but it's very important to go through it the way that it happened the first time. So we can, okay. I'm doing it to retrieve those negative sensations out of you. All right. So I kind of want it. You're not speaking, you're just watching that scene. Start it off and just see it while you're following. And big breath. Big <laughs> breath. Now forget the scene. What okay. I've seen, what sensations do you have right now? Heart beating fast? Um, yeah. Okay. Let's notice that rapid heartbeat. That's all you're thinking about. Okay. I don't want the cleaning, so keep tracking. Take a breath. All right. What sensations are left? Check your body from head to toe. What happened to the heartbeat? Did it move or change in some way? Uh, it slowed down. Very good. Oh, now, what else? Is where were you in your scene? Beginning, middle, end? Because I don't know where you left off. Um, kind of the beginning. Oh, it's still kind of a little bit stuck on the beginning, but it was moving. Not forward. quite to the middle. Oh, okay. that's, that's okay. Right. Now, do you want to press the sensations some more before we go back to the scene, or do you want to just keep moving through it? Because we have to get through it that first time. Yeah, but it's your choice. Yep, yeah, let's get through it. Okay, wherever you left off, you got to just keep seeing that stuff. Because we want to show the brain what we want to get rid of. Okay, so see it. This will be the last time you ever have to see it this way again, I promise you. So I do see it this time, wherever you left off, and follow me. Okay, big breath. Okay. So let's grab what you're feeling now, okay, because you're really upset, right? Let's notice all that upset. Now forget the scene. Just okay. notice what you're feeling. And track really good. Big breath. And what's going on with your sensations right now? Um, from head to toe? Uh, 
the attack is over, but I can't. I I keep seeing mm-hmm. me on the ground, and I keep seeing the blood. I just okay. I can't. So did you go through that part, or did uh, you leave that part? No, out? that I kind of left that out. I, okay. I just thought the attack would, okay. you know. So, but now, so can we put that in? I mean, yeah, can we just make it part of the scene. So we'll go. Let's put put in more of what happened after. And oh, okay. Are you ready, or do you want to press the sensation? Um, no, I yeah. just get it done. So keep going. And so this is what we do next. And you did so good so far. Congratulations on getting through the hardest part. Okay, now we're going to see the scene from the beginning again, but it's not going to look the same. So I have to tell you things that might happen to it. Parts of it could disappear, but you can't see it. Literally, you can't see the images. Or you might get more detail because the trauma is fading. And now you can really look around and see more things. That might happen. Uh, it could go faster, could go slower. Whatever your brain wants to do to process it in a way that's a more normal processing than what, what you went through. So you start it from the beginning, but you're kind of looking for what looks different or feels different about it. Okay, we're checking out the differences. Should be easier to get through. You shouldn't have all, all that stuff you processed out should be gone, so it should be much easier to watch. Okay, okay. so start it from the very beginning. Kind of take a look at what looks or feels different. Okay. And you're going to follow. And big breath, and you looked a little puzzled. But I'm going to ask you, so what looked or felt different that time? Um, <clears throat> I saw the beginning the way I've seen it. Yeah. Um, and the only thing that was kind of the same was the, like, charge through the door. But even that, my reaction to it wasn't, yeah, you, look you know. Uh, I'm puzzled because... The next part, I could. It's like we were we were the main characters, and we're like removed. Like I can't exactly. See, I see the yard, I see the house, but you're way back far but from I, it. Yeah, that's how this works. Wow. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Great. That's why I was kind of. I was like, okay, I think I know what's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be <laughs> yeah. seeing, and I don't see it. That's how this therapy works. Wow. So check your body. You looked fine getting through it. Check oh yeah, I even like I don't I don't feel hunched. I don't feel tight. I mean, a little apprehension at first, thinking like, okay, here we go. But yes. and a little bit of a jump when he came through the door, but it, it, it just nothing. So check your body. Does it feel positive or just neutral? Um, or negative. Okay. Initially, I think I would I would go with neutral, but right but now, na- right positive. I mean, I feel like, <laughs> oh my god, I, I think I could go for that run again. I think I can do that. I know you so was not bad to see you. You got through it. Um, I don't know. It's gonna seem strange. I know it's me. I saw. <clears throat> Myself in the ambulance, which I don't even remember that part, but I saw myself in the ambulance. More detail. And um, I felt like a sense of compassion to this, oh, this poor girl, we're going to help her. That's very exciting, isn't it? I can't shut up now. I'm just like, wow, I just, yeah, I feel really excited. And I did tell you on the phone when you called that you'd be able to go back to work after this, and you said, yeah, right? Yeah, it's kind of like, okay, this woman is great. I've been working on this for so long, and I can't right. believe that in an hour it's going to be done. So, okay, so that's great. So you got through it, and you have compassion. So this is the next part. This is the fun part, if you will. You're the director of the scene. You get to change it. You know how it changed naturally with your brain, but now you get to change it, just like it's a dream. So I can give you examples. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the dog incident could not have happened, and you went. I don't know if you liked dogs before this. I love dogs. I was okay. a dog person. So. so let's say you go up to the door at this particular when this happened, but instead there's a little gorgeous little puppy. So that dog isn't there. Instead, it's replaced with the cutest puppy you've ever seen. You get to pick it up and hug it and do all those things. And the big dog never showed up, or the one that was angry. Um, Or, if you prefer, uh, the big dog showed up, but it didn't bite you. Or it's like whatever you want to, whatever you wish could have happened. But something that would make you happy. And then, when you're done with delivering the mail at the house or whatever, and the incident, say, didn't happen, 
you get to take your earlier self and you and go to the beach or go to the hills or the mountains or wherever you enjoy. So you make it a really good day and you get all of it. And maybe you go for a run. That'd be a good thing. So, or maybe the person you're delivering mail for says, would you mind taking my dog for a run? And it's the cutest little puppy and you get to run up and down the street with it. So you make this a really fun, wonderful thing instead of what happened. Okay. You put in your own version of whatever you wish had happened. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Okay. Start your scene and it's all yours. You okay. direct. You did it? Yeah. Okay. Anything you care to share about how you changed it? Um... I did. I incorporated both of them. I um, did the cute little puppy because it's non-threatening, that type of thing. But I deliver mail to big dog houses, you know. So um, I wanted to keep that in there. And um, the owner came out and said, "Oh, they're so happy to see you." And they came out. We were playing catch in the yard and fetch with the ball. And um, she asked, "Oh, would you mind babysitting?" And I said, "Okay, you're my last house." And we took off and. I brought them home with me, and, <laughs> and it was good. And it was, yeah. Wow. So your sensations have to be wonderful. Are they good? I feel like it, how I felt before that happened, exactly. because that's what I would do. I, I dog sit, sure. I, I yeah. had a dog. Yeah. I, you know. I set you to what you were before that. So any images from the past? Um, no. Okay. So I'm going to give you a set of eye movements to check for images of the past, because we okay. don't want to leave anything behind. If there are any images from the past, we'll erase them, so just look for them. You're a detective. Okay. So you're kind of looking for any still photos that are still left back there, like the first time the dog jumped or any startle moments or the dog's face or anything. You may see nothing. You may not be able to find it. There may be one or two. Either okay. thing could happen. So go ahead back there and look for any photos we missed. And take a big breath. Anything left behind at all? Just the um, the jump through the door. Okay. I want you to take the jump through the door. Hold it in your mind that one moment. Okay. My hand's an eraser. You're going to erase that image from the top down. Here we go. And take a deep breath in and out and tell me, what does that image look like now? Has it changed a little bit? Um, I don't know how to explain it. Just that I, I literally saw it being erased and feeling happy, like, you don't even exist. You're so, not even there. judging on the old scene, we were a 10, but if you were, you've replaced your scene, you can't see the images, you feel different about it. Zero means I can handle it. So if this feeling lasts the way you feel right now, where would that be? Oh, I can totally... Not only can I handle it, but I feel like there is nothing to handle. Like, handle what? <laughs> the trauma's done. You know, it's I don't... We took it apart. And we processed it normally. And now it's done. So you want to move that down to zero? That's what yeah. you want to do? Okay. Now to zero. And how does that feel? Or do you able to push that down from 10 to zero? I I feel like a new me. Like, I feel like not only, oh, I'm back, but like, I never thought I'd be so happy to be me. Uh, Lainey, looks like you're on mute. Okay, am I unmuted now? There you go. Okay, I want to apologize to everybody. Apparently, you saw a box. I didn't see it, so I didn't know what to do about it. Uh, technology is what I need to be arted for because <laughs> it can be difficult for me. Uh, as good as I am with the therapy is as bad as I can be with this technology stuff. Um, I think the box is off now, is it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I did work with a COVID uh, client, and uh, I'll play that for you. It's uh, Well, I actually had a follow-up to the postal worker, which I want to play, but then I'm going to play the COVID client. She came in, and she mentioned uh, during her session uh, that she was still not tasting or smelling, even though she was done with the COVID from three months earlier. So I said, hey, let's take a few minutes and work on that. Uh, when she went home, she said... Uh, you know, I got rid. It seems like I got rid of eighty percent. I can, I can, I can taste again. I can smell. I said, "What about the other twenty percent?" So I had her come back in the next day. Uh, we did a full session, and she is going to be on a TV spot with me locally because she wants to share that 
there is a way to get the taste and smell back. So I will play that for you, but I want to quickly uh, play the follow-up for the uh, postal worker. And, uh, the you know, I'm not a professional um, videographer, so uh, if you're hearing some kind of whooshy sound, that's just because my technology, as I said, is not uh, perfect. So I'm going to, let's say I want to get rid of that. I'm going to play the follow-up, and then I'll play you the COVID uh, client. One session with you, I started delivering my route with my boss. Not because I needed it, but because right. they needed right. assurance that I was okay. Right. Um, and now I'm doing my route. Um, I can't even explain how <laughs> happy I am oh, to... Wow have my life back. I mean, I have, not only do I not have any fear going up to a house, I actually have a sense of joy walking up to a house thinking, I, I don't even know what I'm thinking, just happiness, just pure happiness. And, how and I, today yeah. was the first day that they let me deliver to the veterinarian's place. Oh, it's a dog place. It's dogs. dogs in the, there was five dogs there today. Yeah. Everybody was happy to see me. I was fine with the dogs. And I feel like I'm back. Like Okay, so that was that follow-up. So I'm going to get out of that. Um, so again, I did see this person who had had COVID. Uh, I did a six-minute uh reduction in the hour-long uh, session. So I will tell you that, uh, but uh, I'm going to play this for you. Problem. So so you came yesterday, yes. and we did a session on something you wanted to do, and that worked out well, because you went from 10 to 0, what you would allow me to say. And um, then afterward, I said, you don't have any taste left, because in November, you had COVID, now we're at the end of January 2021, and uh, we did a few minutes of art for the taste. And you and tell me what happened. You, I said, let me know. And so before we did that, um, all I could really sense was um, if something was sweet or spicy or um, bitter, but no flavors. Um, so then, like last night, I could taste like my dinner, like the actual flavors. And I never, like I haven't been able to do that for wow. months. Wow. And, and I can smell, I can smell <laughs> the banana and I ate the banana and it tasted like banana. And I just, um, I wasn't expecting it to work like that. Wow. That's so good. And you said to me, uh, cause I asked you to get back to me and <clears throat> you said, I have my taste and smell back 80%. So how do you know there's 20% missing? <laughs> well, uh, it's hard to describe losing your taste and smell because they're, it's not black and white. And so it's a gradual thing, kind of like on a spectrum. So like I can, I, I can taste the flavors now, but they're not as um, bold okay. or um, intense as... They were before. Okay, I lost. so a little bit fat. You, you, there's a little difference, but yet you can taste. Correct. So I thought <clears throat> tonight uh, we would um, actually, we didn't focus on the COVID last time, but it was, I'm sure it was an experience to have it. And yep. just from the time you learned and probably were shocked that it was positive, just hearing the word positive, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so if we did the scene, where you uh, found out you had the COVID. Uh, maybe you first, like I did, learned about it on TV when you see people, you know, in another country scurrying around because they're all wearing masks. And you're like, what is that about, you know? That's how it happened for me. Yeah. And now we're doing it. So maybe to go through what you put together for, for that and then uh, having them say it's positive and then having no sense of the smell and the taste. I'm not sure you told me your other symptoms. That was, those were pretty it, much the only We're going to do right. the next step, which is to go see the scene a second time. I'm going to anoint you as a detective, 
and you're going to see if it looks or feels different this time going through it. Okay, so just notice the differences uh, and start it again. It could change. It could go faster, but it could go slower because as trauma fades, you may get more detail with positive things in it. Who knows, you know? Um, maybe things are blurry. You can't see them. Who knows? So you're the detective. You'll tell me. If you finish early, start it again. But let's see the whole scene from the beginning and see what looks and feels different. So far, what looks or feels different about this part? Um, it's more segmented. Okay. And how about the sensations you have? How does that feel? It's more like I'm not like directly involved, experiencing like, it. So you're removed, yeah. which is exactly what's supposed to happen as you become quickly desensitized. So the That's next great. part, you're the director. I can suggest to widen the breadth of your choice, and I might say, you never got COVID. Um, <clears throat> you got something, but it was a good thing, <laughs> whatever that'll be. Um, so you're going to make uh, that scene a better thing and exclude And let's see uh, if your taste... You know, feels fully back. And can you smell it too? Does it have the smell? Yeah. Okay. Mm. It's it's winter green. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that you said was one of your favorite flavors. Mm -hmm. And are you getting the full enjoyment? Like you used to? Yeah, it, it tastes like wintergreen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So more than you did before you came in. Mm -hmm. And when you were from yesterday, you went from not being able to taste to 80%. So I said, come in, let's knock off the other 20. What do you think? Um, <laughs> it's, it seems back. Yeah. Oh, what do you think? So if someone asked you, I, <laughs> I, I don't even, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know. Hard to believe yeah, it. We, yeah. we did get rid of the images for the COVID. So if your brain thinks you'd never had it, then it's going to return your, it doesn't have to warn you by saying, hey, you have something, go to the doctor because you can't taste. You don't need the warning anymore, perhaps. So it says, oh, you can have your taste back. Wow, yeah. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know what to say. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. All right. And we'll save time for questions later. Um, and I think I'm going to show you someone who I had a fear of heights. She was my demo, and this is what happened with her. Okay, so... You were uh, in an art training. Yes, I was. And you got to do your scene, which was a fear of going up stairs, especially if they have slots and you could see through them, right? Yes. And if I could manage to get up the stairs, I had to hang on to the railings. That was right. really important. Or I would get intense vertigo. And right. sometimes even I would lose peripheral vision and it would like black out, almost like an ocular migraine. And, right, and so you'd spend about 40 minutes doing art. Yesterday. And yes. so now we're going to see you go up the yes. stairs. You're all excited. So here we go. And you're going up to the top with no hands. <laughs> That's amazing. How, how does that feel? And well, it's now, easier the second time. Oh, it's even easier. How is it up there? And I can even get over here and I can look down at you, lady. Yeah, that's great because you were afraid to get to the edge of things. Uh, you have no idea how free it is. Oh, that's so great. That's yeah. so great. Now we'll see you come down. To not have that kind of fear. That's amazing. We love accelerated <laughs> resolution therapy. <laughs> Getting rid of the images for the old stuff and replacing it with new images is what has worked for you. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well that was great. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Um,
I got a message from somebody that it could be that somebody put that block up uh, for HIPAA, but these clients have all given me permission to show these videos in writing, so we're, we should be okay here. So uh, I'm going to show a couple more things before I open it up for uh, questions because we did make it a 90-minute talk. Uh, we extended it. Um, so I'm going to show you somebody who had dyslexia with a lot of trauma attached to it. And I'm just going to show you uh, uh, what happened after when I asked him to get up and read uh, in front of the uh, group we were training. Once a clinician has determined that it would be appropriate to consider art for a client, they should provide the client with some educational material about art. You will, receive, you will receive a laminated informational document in your basic art course to help describe art to your clients. Before yesterday afternoon, there is no way in the world that I would have been able to do that. <clears throat> I've been dealing with dyslexia my entire life. From second to sixth grade, I went to Children's Hospital on Tuesdays and Thursdays for a couple hours each day to get assistance with it. And it helped, but as an example of how I was still dealing with it, in graduate school, I would go to class and people would come in talking about, oh my God, we had so much homework last night. It took me two hours to read that. And I was thinking to myself, two? Hell, it took me six. You've got to be kidding me. So, you know, that was just dealing with reading to myself. Reading out loud was a completely different problem. Reading out loud, I had to read a few words at a time to myself and then go back and read it out loud. And then a few words to myself and go back and read it out, out loud. So it was very jerky, very broken. This may have been a little jerky or a little broken, but it's light years different from what it was yesterday afternoon. Yesterday afternoon, I was doing, I'm in the basic art class right now. I was reading the script out loud for the first time. I had familiarized myself with it a few times the night before, in the morning as well, thinking, okay, I'll be able to get through this. I knew it was going to be jerky and broken, but I figured I would be able to get through it. And I did, but evidently I had more trouble than most people do with it. Lainey happened to be the person working with me. We talked about it afterwards, and she said, um, you know, I explained I have dyslexia, and, you know, I knew it was going to be difficult, but, you know, I got through it. And she said, well, do you want to get rid of it? And I kind of chuckled. I was like, yeah, sure. I thought to myself, it's not going to go away, but if it gets better, great, you know. Well, as you know, we did art for less than 10 minutes, and she asked me to read out loud again, and I did, and it was smooth, and I couldn't believe it. She asked me if I would read to the class, knowing that that would be something else, and it provoked a lot of anxiety. We did art for the anxiety, and I got up in front of the class yesterday afternoon and read. Um, the other aspect of this is writing. I have been, I've had a horrible problem with writing, trying to get my message out on paper my entire life. I dropped out of college for a while because of this. She asked me to write my story, and in 15 to 20 minutes, I wrote it out. This would have taken easily an hour. I don't know how long it would have taken. The problem is, after art, it seems so normal to just sit down and write it that I didn't even have to think about it. It, it didn't, there was no block. There was no difficulty getting it on the page. And it seems so normal now, I can't even really think about how difficult it used to be. And it's I, I can't even explain. It's blowing my mind. I don't... Yeah. And how is it going to change your life? You 
<laughs> we talked about your being able to read to your kids now. It's something that you had your wife do. The simple idea of being able to read to my children a story um, without having to stop every couple words, the fact that they might be able to enjoy me reading to them. It's big. Just kills me. But... Well, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> because we added that extra bit of time, I have a little more time to show you uh, some interesting things here. So I was in a training in Arizona. We had some time left over. There were actually five people in the group, and uh, one of them I used for a different demo, but uh, I asked them if there was anything they wanted to work on, and each one had a little something. And so this is uh, them talking about uh, what we did. So you had a problem with your jaw. Yeah. Yeah, for a long time. I tried everything. Muscle relaxers, some weird laser thing, massage therapy, like everything you can imagine. And I have a night splint. And we did a few minutes of the accelerated resolution therapy art. Yeah. And how do you feel? It feels so different. Like it, it was almost like I could just sort of feel it drain out and it just, like it doesn't hurt right now. We is... gave you an imaginary jawbreaker and it broke up the <laughs> yeah. tension. Yeah, like my jaw feels so loose. And it's the first time we've all seen you smile like that because your jaw was a problem. Because it was so tight, yeah, yeah. And now you can have a big smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So uh, we experimented with art for a hip pain because you were walking in a way that was sort of uneven. Right. I was having uh, some hip pain in my right hip and I knew that my gait was thrown off and I was out of balance. and. Within a few minutes of the art session, I could feel the right hip just relaxing and then got the image of the ballerina, which gave me kind of a, a body to be in to move differently. And I was able to move much more readily, much more smoothly, much more rapidly. And it looked equal. And it Your looked legs equal. looked equal. It felt equal. That's yeah. fantastic, yes. Um, thank you for sharing. So you worked on tinnitus or tinnitus, yeah. however you want to pronounce that. And what happened? It was so weird that it just kept getting softer and softer and softer. And it's been, you know, about half an hour and things are still shifting. And I was telling somebody else that I am now so much more aware of all the other sounds. Um, in the room. In the room the and outside. Sound. And and I, like I said, I'm hearing a lower hum. Can you hear that? Yeah. yeah I think that's something else. It was it's weird in this sensation of relief even just that moment like when I was there and I had a, that moment of complete silence which I have not had I said my earliest recollection was when I was six years old and uh, that was a long time ago. So you feel pretty good it's exciting for it's you? It's amazing. Oh, it thank amazing. you. Okay <clears throat> I have one more video and then we can go to questions. Okay so the fact that I would even think about going to the doctor I would almost start getting hives, or possibly I wouldn't know, and I would get to the doctor, and they said they were going to do it, and I was like, no, you can't, I haven't had prep time. For a needle, because you have a needle. <laughs> For the needle. Yeah. Um, I have almost passed out in the doctor's office a couple times, and in other facilities. So, I'm trying to conjure it up, because I can't even watch medical shows, and I'm trying to conjure it up. And it's not there, and I'm thinking this can't be true, but it is. And you have so to go anyway, for needles frequently. Yes, and now I have to go for some medical checkups. Yeah. And, and you're not afraid, it, so. not, not afraid of the needle now? No, I'll go uh, to my flower garden How long instead. did it take us? Maybe less than five minutes. <laughs> so you're pretty <laughs> a happy. lifetime of pain and fear, yes. Yep, and you feel like it's too good to be true. That's what we always hear with art. Absolutely. I think I'm trying to bring it up, and, and it's not. And before the thought of it, my stomach would, it, it would almost make me nauseous, okay? And now it's 
Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to stop the sharing. I love sharing, would love to share with you more, but I thought people might have questions. Um, Thank you, Lainey. Um, <laughs> we have some questions from the chat. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see. We were talking about this first question a little bit before we got on, but I don't think everyone got a chance to hear, so it'd be great to cover it again. Um, sure. But they would love to hear your perspective on doing art uh, virtually. Okay, so it's very powerful, and you do have to show the brain the problem the first time. So <clears throat> the very first time through can be challenging for a client as you take away the negative sensations. Um, I have a bad image in my head of doing it virtually with nobody else there. The person gets upset the very first time through. They leave the screen, and you hear a gunshot. Like, that would be horrible. So what I, the only way I'll do it uh, and what I have done is to train somebody in what we call safety. So we have a training called sensation awareness focus technique. So we will teach people who are professionals how to um, uh, do eye movements just for relaxation. And we sometimes teach our clients how to do it on their own just to get rid of sens negative sensations. And we will teach somebody in the household, you know, rather than have them go untreated. If we can get somebody to do the hand movements for us and explain how to do that, and they're sitting with the client. Now remember, the client doesn't have to give any details about their issue. So it makes it okay in some ways for a, uh, if a family member is comfortable and the client is comfortable with them doing the eye movement, then you can talk the client through uh, without having to hear the details. Uh, and they have somebody there to make sure if they leave the screen, they can go after them and bring them back. So I worry about them leaving the screen the first time through. After the first time, they're desensitized. It gets much easier to uh, work with after they don't have the sensations for the problem anymore. Then it's all uphill. But uh, I do worry about that quite a bit. I do prefer it in person. I wear a mask. The client will uh, wear a mask and, uh, you know, it can be done that way. Yeah. We have another question. Um, Mark, who is a veteran, said, asks, uh, what kind of success have you had with veterans? I did something like this at the VA's National Center for PTSD to help with his nightmares. Regrettably, I didn't have a lot of success with it. Well, he. Probably, I don't know if he was doing a... EMDR, if you want to ask him uh, uh, or not. EMDR. So EMDR, right. So EMDR, I have problems with EMDR, but I don't want to say a lot of negative things about it. I learned the eye movements there, and, and some EMDR therapists swear by it and have good results. I'm not very good at EMDR. Um, I would suggest if that didn't work for him that he find an art therapist. Uh, we are different. He will see the difference in how we do it. Um, the first study we did was with veterans, and it averaged uh, three and a half sessions to get rid of all the PTS. So that might be more than one uh, scene, right? Um, um, I worked with Brian Anderson, who created the Veterans Alternative, where they are flown in for free treatment, where he might want to try that in Florida. And uh, Brian came in and he said, I demand four sessions of this. I said, try one. He had horrible, horrible PTS uh, where he would see people he'd lost driving next to him in the car next to him. He'd have hallucinations. And after the one session, that all stopped. He was so amazed. He created the Veterans Alternative. This person should call. It's in um, uh, Florida. And they fly you in for no charge. They'll give you five sessions of my treatment. He should try that. I think he should call there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question is, isn't one of the problems with PTSD is that the traumatized person often forgets some of the details of the actual event? And if so, how would you address those with art? Yeah. Well, thank goodness uh, that the body doesn't forget. A lot of people know Bessel, you know, Vanderkoek's uh, body keeps score. And uh, the body doesn't forget. The sensations are there. And you can always put the sensations into an image that will represent whatever the problem is. So 
uh, you can pull on any one of these threads, the image, the sensations, uh, you know, you can get to it in other ways. You could do it metaphorically, for example, too. So we don't need for that person to remember, but with the right amount of eye movements, they could recall it as the trauma fades and they look around, they might be able to, to actually make a connection to it with a scene match, but it doesn't matter because we could do it metaphorically. It's fine. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Laura would like to know, do you do every scene individually or do they link? If you have a whole childhood of trauma, you can have them take snippets of the worst parts and you can do a whole childhood in an hour because you're going through the snippets. And what happens is they get a different perspective. So we show a video during the training of somebody who changes her life because she changes her perspective and says things like, I think that my childhood made me who I am. I'm stronger for it. Uh, I didn't die. You know, she got, comes out with different perspectives. But you can take snippets and you want to erase the worst images, you know. Um, and uh, if you've lost somebody and you feel loyal to them and you don't want to erase those images, you have to ask yourself, do you want to be remembered by your worst possible moment? Nobody wants to be remembered by their worst possible moments. And so you can do a gestalt, go back and have them say to the person, show me a, a picture of how you want to be remembered. And in their mind, they can get a picture of the way that person wanted to be remembered. Yeah. Excellent. Great answer. Laura, hopefully that answers your question. If you have any follow-ups, let us know in the chat. Um, another question, um, and uh, admittedly, I don't know what this means, so hopefully you do. Um, <laughs> How do you process feeder memories? Uh, so are they meaning uh, one memory that leads into another? Can you ask for a little more on that too? Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So I'll ask for clarification on that. Yeah, just a little bit. The next question. Um, so let's go to the next question for a moment. Is the technique that you use similar to the flash technique in EMDR? You know, I'm not sure what that is. When I took the training, which was probably 2007-ish, I didn't uh, learn that. So maybe everybody learns a little bit differently. So I don't know what that is. I know there's a, uh, a uh, uh, I don't know. I, I have to say that I just wasn't taught that. So uh, we erase paint, replace an image with the right amount of eye movements and it works and the person will sit there and say i can't see it anymore i can't see it anymore and uh they really can't bring it up after we do that so as long as they're on board with getting rid of those negative images uh you know you can do pain by getting rid of the image of the accident we do that i had a video of that but i didn't want to spend more time on the videos you know but uh surely if you bring up the image of the accident with the car and if you can erase it their pain will you know, be abated too, you know, with that. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sure the, there's lots of different uh, versions of it out there. So yeah, it might just be something new. So um, definitely anyone watching this, let us know if you have any follow-ups, we can always get them answered later. Uh, one final question we have is since art moves so quickly, can the system be more easily overwhelmed and cause disassociation? And if so, then what? So, Everybody dissociates when they're doing art because we're creating a lucid, good dream, and so we're all in a different state. Uh, disassociation is a really good thing. I give a little story about when I was young and I was on a roller coaster with my older brother, but I was too young to be on it. And uh, we got to the top, and my brother <clears throat> actually told me after <clears throat> he had to hold me in or I would have fallen out. And at the top, I decided I didn't want to go down that roller coaster. So Suddenly, I close my eyes and I'm unwrapping presents on a holiday and I'm not there. So when uh, we get somebody that we know dissociates, <clears throat> they might be best, excuse me, to do <clears throat> the fear flip script, which is all, you know, like creating a good dream. But people who dissociate tend to like this therapy because they've been doing it anyway. And it is sort of a form of dissociation in a way as you create a good dream. Excellent. Thank you so much. 
All right. So if anyone has any other questions, uh, now's a great time to ask. Otherwise, we yes, will. We left some time for that. Yeah, we have a little <laughs> bit of time. So we, we give you a minute to type them out. Um, I know the, the person who asked about the feeder memories is here, um, but I don't know if there's a clarification coming. Um, but I, no I did, I'm not that familiar with that term. Uh, I think I've heard it. Yeah, it's really familiar, familiar, but I'm not entirely sure either. All right. But, well, you know, if they're talking about origin, that's when we do the scene match. We get down. I think of it as a house of cards. If you have a trauma built on a trauma, built on a trauma, built on a trauma, then it's a house of cards. You have to try to get down, if you can, to the origin. Once you do the origin, the presenting problem doesn't feel very difficult for them to go through because mm -hmm. you've removed the origin, you know, but we can, as I've said, uh, just put it in a metaphor and that will represent the origin too in all of its pieces. So that works as well. That makes sense. Uh, we have a question here from Jane. Jane would like to know if the person you're working with is staring off and won't follow the eye, uh -huh. eye movements, can you continue? Well, if they don't want to be there, I would dismiss them <laughs> to begin with. If it's because they don't, I would. I would want to know why they're staring off. Um, I've done psychogenic seizures, by the way, and I'm going to be doing somebody with that uh, this weekend. I asked them to bring a note saying it's okay to move their eyes quickly back and forth, and to bring someone with them that's familiar with them when they have a seizure. But uh, we can do the psychogenic seizures because it's usually based on some images, right? And I've been very successful with that. Um, so I don't know why they're staring off. Uh, I don't know if there's something interesting outside the window. I don't know <laughs> why they're doing that, but I would bring their attention back gently uh, to, uh, I usually use a stick with a card on it now. And I, I did before COVID too, because it's very easy to manipulate and sit further back than we used to. Uh, and it works just as well. But I think I'd need to know a little bit more. If it was just, you know, they were preoccupied with something else, I would just gently say, oh, could you please follow the card? I mean, I have no idea why they're steering off. Jane is saying that um, in this case, assuming it's disassociation. So they do want to be there. They just go somewhere else. I guess I'd use the same grounding techniques, but I'd probably try to have them follow while I did it. So we all know as therapists, grounding techniques are, you're in the room, notice you're sitting in the chair and come back to me. Uh, uh, and uh, I guess I would just try to figure it out. But, you know, every client's different. Uh, and I don't know, you know, if it's just a gentle staring off, it might be easy to get them back. Uh, so I think I would have to be with that client. Makes yeah. sense. Jane, See hopefully that, yeah. that answers your question. Um, yeah. Feel free to ask any follow-ups and we can get them answered. Uh, we do have a clarification on the feeder memories question. Oh, good. And so what they're asking is essentially uh, searching for the right origin. With complex PTSD, it can be hard, uh, they can imagine, to get to the origin memory. Okay. I don't have the word complex in my uh, vocabulary. I call it more scenes. So we try not to go down with the client and get enmeshed in the contents. But if you do a scene match and you take the sensations and match them to an earlier time when they felt that way, you can often get down a little deeper. But again, you don't have to get to the origin with this therapy. You can simply take the sensations and put them into an image that the client chooses. And that will represent the whole enchilada, which is why that's even quicker. So it's not in you know, essential to get into the bottom of that, uh, you know, image. Probably if you help out by doing this metaphorical moment, they may be able to start remembering because I've had clients come in and they don't have a memory of their childhood. And through doing art, they're able to uh, get that memory back. And so uh, I was a little amused by the last time I did that because she started to be uh, overwhelmed with remembering her childhood. I remember this, I remember that. And then she forgot her coat. So I kind of laughed. <laughs> she called, she goes, well, I I'm so excited. I forgot my coat. <laughs> Pretty funny. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great ask. Um, I think uh, the last question, one that has been asked a few times is, what are the upcoming training and certification 
opportunities for therapists? So we do give CEs. And uh, if you go to the website, which is www.artworks, W-O-R-K-S, now, N-O-W.com. And I have a TEDx talk there as well. Um, and if you go to the website, um, you can see all the opportunities. I, I've been doing it out of my living room with four people since COVID. Uh, a lot of people are still doing trainings in different parts of the country as well. And uh, we have uh, our own certification through the International Society for Art. You would take a test and you would get uh, certified um, that way as well uh, uh, with us. You know, we have certifications after you. T- uh, take each training. Um, yeah, but I would go to the website because you can just sign up right there. Um, yeah. Excellent. And what was that website again? One more time. Uh, www.art, standing for Accelerated Resolution Therapy, works, W-O-R-K-S, now, N-O-W dot com. Because, you know, I'll tell you one thing I promise all my clients. I promise you, you will know whether it worked or not at the end of this session. You will know right away that it because it works in the moment. Excellent. Thank you. We will make sure to include a link to that when we post the video. And um, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. I loved it. Loved it. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity.